The cybersecurity landscape is full of single solution providers, making it easy for unexpected cyber threats to sneak through the cracks. That's why Fortra is creating a stronger, simpler strategy for protection, one that increases your security maturity while decreasing the operational burden that comes with it. This is all possible thanks to Fortra's best-in-class portfolio and deep bench of expert problem solvers. Fortra's integrated, scalable solutions help customers face their toughest challenges with confidence. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Fortra. Customers want fast and frictionless digital experiences, yet also expect protection against breaches, privacy violations, and fraud. Drive engagement by optimizing security and convenience to attract and retain customers. Use the Ping One cloud platform to build, test, and optimize digital experiences. The no-code orchestration engine weaves together authentication, user management, and MFA, all of which can enhance security, drive engagement, and boost revenues. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ping identity to learn more. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover in one of the shows? Submit your questions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. All right, for our next interview, Today, Ryan Pullen joins us uh, to talk about building the right business culture to manage human error. Ryan is head of cybersecurity at Stripe OLT, is experienced in pen testing, incident response, and OSINT, and is a recent TEDx speaker. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you very much for having me. How how was that TEDx process? Uh, It it seems (laughs) like, I mean, even, even the TEDx ones, like I, I just imagine it's a very long and stressful process to prep for that. It's it's really interesting because I I did it in my hometown, and so it wasn't any traveling or anything like that, which I had to account for, which was which was really good. Um, but there was certainly a lot of revisions because for the first time I wasn't talking to a audience who was interested in the topic. It had to be more generalized. And so I find myself more specifically looking at generalistic examples, which, you know, the type of SMS campaigns that come out this time of year, protecting people, keeping people safe. But I talked about different narratives. And so it gave the audience a bit more of an understanding of how everyone can be impacted by cybercrime. And so, for example, one scenario, I was uh, the responder understanding the impact potentially on some employees and some businesses and then in a very much a different perspective i was the target and so how it how people targeted me and found some information about me it wasn't actually targeted per se it was more of a phone scam but it was very sophisticated and so the preparation was it was the most important part for me because i wanted to make sure that i could communicate the challenges that i see day in day out but also target the masses from those kind of drive-by campaigns as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I watched it yesterday, and I, I I thought it was pretty good because it's um, I think it's interesting to see that from different perspectives. Because you you talked about uh, uh, doing pretexting as well, you know, which is uh, an interesting thing in pen testing because uh, back when I pen tested, uh, we had certain people in in the firm. Uh, that were willing to do social engineering, and then certain ones that weren't because they they it it, uh, it actually conflicted with their personal ethics. Uh, where even if they were hired to lie to the employees of of a customer, they weren't comfortable doing that. So so we had very specific people uh, that that excelled and were comfortable doing doing different uh, different things. It's, it's very interesting. We, uh, in a few different occasions, we've used people who are not trained penetration testers for uh, for these jobs. For example, uh, your sales team are often your most proficient on the phones and more comfortable uh, facing objections and things like that. And when you're really assessing high security facilities and places who you're automatically going to meet that resistance, if you haven't necessarily got that technical objective in mind it can allow you to be more dynamic and so i completely understand that that ethical boundary and to be honest i i don't do 
any of those kind of engagements anymore, to be honest. And much more business centric with uh, leading culture and, and growth of the business. But that was an engagement where I I was the person that was going to try and obtain access the, the first time, mainly with just a genuine reason, but I couldn't disclose the reason to the person behind the desk. And therefore mm. I was playing on their more vulnerable side because I had traveled uh, three hours and I was there for that meeting and I couldn't touch any of the data without being in the premise and all of these sorts of things. And so it is an inner conflict for sure. But if you're doing it for the right purposes and then you're able to provide the improvements, it gives you that sense of being able to make these improvements so someone can't do it for malicious purposes. Yeah, and, and to uh, to dive into the conversation here, I feel like my my co-hosts are, are kind of rearing to go on this topic. Uh, everybody seems excited about it. Um, but uh, you Certainly, for me personally, one one of my irritations is the the idea that the the humans are the weakest link is, is something that we hear all the time, and, and every time I hear that, I think like 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 ha, ha, you know that's only possible if we don't realize that humans are a part of our business, you know, because we we understand humans are fallible, humans are going to make mistakes, you know, so for for them to be the weakest link, we would have to not prepare at all, you know, for, for humans being part of this. Uh, like, it's why the world around us has has things like traffic lights and crosswalks. It's why flying cars aren't aren't a thing. You know, we can barely handle them on, on the ground, much less in, in, in the air with an extra dimension thrown in. So it's, it's uh, you know, it seems madness to me to say, Ah, you know, there's just, you know, what can you do? You know, uh, people are going to click links. And if, if your entire organization is is just a, a single employee clicking a link away from from devastation, I, I feel like you, you've designed things very, very wrong. You know, so that's that's kind of why I was excited about this conversation, because it gets into, you know, gets past that point of, OK, yes, you know, humans are going to make mistakes. We can try to train them, you know, but, uh, you know, we know we're never going to hit 100%. So, so what can we do about our culture uh, to actually, uh, you know, encourage people to make less mistakes, make sure it's okay to make mistakes? Because there's certainly another direction that you can go here, a much sharper, um, more worrying direction. And I've seen many companies do it, where you fail a phishing test, uh, and you get written up, you fail too many phishing tests, and people are firing their employees for not being good at you know, stopping fishing. It's it's quite remarkable, to be honest, that that shift in that direction, because you mentioned a really interesting point around the flying cars and things like that. Tesla is one of the you know most public hyper growth organizations out there, and they're literally trying to reduce the amount of fatalities on the road through system automation and the processing power that that can exist. Okay. That's, that's a controversial topic, whether we're there or not, and those sorts of things. But you're absolutely right. The human is a part of the kill chain. Your employees uh, can be more empathetic and more understanding, and therefore that can be exploited, right? That's exactly what I was talking about previously. And so if you are taking the approach around the performance-based, if you click so many, you you are punished via these methods, that's only going to instill fear and that's only going to instill more issues to really exist within your your economy so you know ron was talking about it in the previous segment and i i thought he hit the nail on the head around you know your intelligent individuals you don't want to assess uh, a fish on its ability to climb a tree for example and so if you assess everybody on their ability to be able to detect uh, a phishing email the, the people you know interested in this community are highly you know are more likely based on your standardized drive by phishing emails to do so than someone who maybe works in manufacturing or finance or healthcare or something in that domain where it's not technologically focused and so i think the 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 transition in the culture from my perspective and something because I feel very passionately about this, because I've seen that exact example take place where 
the, the phishing campaign was so targeted. They were already on the inside. They were just trying to get a better foothold from a true employee. And they chose to punish this individual, right? Now, business pressures, needing to make an example, things like that put to a side, that's an incredibly difficult position for that individual to be in because at that time, you can do all of the training in the world that you like on a certain day with certain circumstances, with certain conversations. Most people who work in the security industry would be able to create a fishing, you know, a successful fish, I believe. And so where I think organizations should shift should be the mean time to, re to respond and the mean time to detect when something has actually gone wrong. And that's by enabling a culture of almost acceptance and knowing that something's going to happen wrong, have, go wrong one day. Now, that's exactly what Ron said in the previous segment. Something's going to go wrong at some point. The better you are prepared, the, the more available and the readier you are to actually respond to this. And so, for example, if you have a culture where if you click a phishing email and you're more likely to be punished than supported, I think it's illogical for people to expect people to try and you know, report those things further upstream and do the right thing and help prevent that next stage ransom attack with the MO. They're going to hide it. The next ransomware They're going to hide it, right? Exactly, exactly. And so if, you, if you're in a position where you know the security team or you know the IT team and you don't, you're not the kind of person that picks up the phone and shouts at them because something's broken on your device, there are people too. If you become a more conclusive and supportive ecosystem, your results can be quite drastic, to be honest. And that also goes for consultancy functions, managed services, and everything associated. If they feel like, I may have done something wrong here, I'd rather check, as opposed to, I think I clicked something, I don't know the impact, but I know I've, if I've clicked that, I won't get a bonus at the end of the year. I'm probably going to roll the dice and take my chances. And so it's quite, it's quite a, a hanging in the balance uh, position for that individual. When if you go so hard in the other direction, now it might not work at all scales, but it certainly works, you know, to some capacity within, you know, sub 20,000 seats for sure, because you're able then to prevent things on a more consistent basis and actually detect those issues, you know, revoke MFA sessions, enforce password resets, the simple basic security controls before that more nefarious individual has got their hands on something if they've done the classic Microsoft 365 password reset phishing campaign, you know, failed for that. Right. And, and with the uh, with the thesis there out of the way, Katie, I think you had an interesting question about um, folks that get confused about the term culture, about what culture is. Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, and it was triggered a little bit yesterday when there was that story about a French employee who was fired for not fitting into culture. This is this is sort of tangentially related, but, you know, talking about culture and what fit means, you know, I guess just to set a, a baseline, what when you talk about culture, what does that mean to you? To, to me personally, I think you need to align with your company values and the company goal. And I think that itself can create a culture of uh, the, a similar ecosystem where people are in the same boat, moving in the same direction. And you get toxic individuals and toxic, um, you know, self-centered agendas at times, which can, can try to, you know, break that apart or, or have an ulterior motive. New ideas are very important, but there's different ways in which you can kind of endorse them. And so to me, a positive working culture is where you're there to support that that common goal and not punish people for things that can occur at a moment's notice where there's so many different variables and it's not just a, we've told you a thousand times that this particular thing factually may occur and you've done it again. Now, there's different scales to all of this, but for me, that's that's the nuts and bolts of what a culture should entail. And it should be like-minded people on a similar goal 
uh, working collect collaboratively? I think where a lot of companies get caught up in the term culture and fit is mistaking people who are working towards a company goal, a financial goal, a product goal, a mission goal with the idea of like-minded thinking, i.e. having cliques of people or having people who all get along on a personal level as if it's more of a social club than a work environment. And I've certainly seen in my own life and with many friends and colleagues in the industries where there is almost like an in crowd at organizations. And that's not really why people should be hired. And that's not why, certainly not why they should be rewarded. That was part of the issue with this Frenchman who just won a major lawsuit against his company for being fired for not participating in these more social types of things. And I think there is an overlap um, or, or not an overlap, but there's um, there can be a tendency to misconstrue what culture means with almost like this herd mentality. And it's one thing to have people who are very mission oriented and goal oriented and have a dedication to the company and doing their best. And it's it's a very different thing when you have people who are in this herd mentality because there is a tendency for people to be, they want to fit in on a social level. They want to fit in on a personal level. And often those people get rewarded more than the people who will stand up and say, hold on a minute. They are seen as dissenters. They are seen as argumentative instead of somebody who's maybe just asking the company or their manager or their colleagues to think about something from a different perspective. Because a couple of years ago, we were talking very, very much about the idea of diversity and diversity of thought, not just diversity in terms of, you know, what's your gender breakdown? What's your, you know, country breakdown? What's your age breakdown? What's your, you know, all, all of those different personal demographic pieces of information, but diversity of thought and having people who will push boundaries to make companies, to make products and services better. Now there seems to be a little bit of a reversion to this idea of, hey, let's everybody fit in. Um, and I do certainly think that there are instances, again, that I've personally seen and that I've had my friends and colleagues also talk about where it's hey, you have to fit in and be like everybody else. And that's not, in my personal opinion, what culture should be about. So how, I know that was a very long diatribe, but how do you differentiate between that? How do you adapt your culture? How do you make sure that your culture allows for individuality? Individuality in thought, individuality in work practices and habits, you know, you don't want to encourage people to click links and put the company in danger. You certainly don't want to encourage people to just go completely rogue on projects. But how do you encourage that individuality of thought, work ethic, work habits without going over to the line of we all must act the same and talk the same and and be the same for us to have a culture that is ubiquitous, that is seamless, that is, you know, you know, whatever culture it is, if it's, you know, Exonius or Tenchi or, or Jupiter One, or whatever the culture, uh, whatever the company may be. I, th I think the, that's a really hard narrative to, to kind of summarize. But for, from my perspective with the organization, I actually pride myself on hiring people from different backgrounds, because I think if you hire people who have done the same uh, master's degree or been to the same college and done the same curriculum and they're there to do the same job, you're very much hiring from a centered pool, which in some industries works great. For example, Harvard Law and the like. But when you're presented with different challenges every single day, I think it's really important to enable people to use their backgrounds and use their ulterior skill sets to be able to utilize that when 
speaking to uh, frustrated individuals, uh, people who don't know left from right because they're in an instant scenario. And so we've we've hired people who have worked in um, healthcare. We've worked. We've hired people who have been, you know, manual laborers. Uh, you know, your standard masters educated university path. Uh, people from military backgrounds, intelligence communities, and those sorts of things. And so with, with that itself, people bring lots of different ideas of way in doing things. But when it comes to hiring the right culture in particular, uh, one of my favorite books is called The Ideal Team Player by Patrick Lencioni. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but in, in the book, it's not, it's not a very long book, but they assess people based on three criteria. Um, and those criteria are humble, hungry, and smart. And humble being able to be able to empathetic with people. And if you find something that's happened wrong, be able to support that individual in correcting the challenge and making sure it doesn't happen again by actually being there for that person, not naming and shaming and highlighting the issue because uh, that doesn't support necessarily the right behaviors. Uh, smart being understanding human interaction and social economics basically being able to have those conversations with different people understanding not everybody speaks the same uh, technological language or even the same dialect at all and then having that hunger for the same mission which is where i said about the boat leading in the same direction and so that direction can take multiple different paths but if the common goal is there i think it allows people to move quite efficiently in the same direction and so when you hire based on those criteria, and it's very much born out of the, the Simon Sinek performance versus trust relationship model. And so you could have a very high performer of low trust, which would be a toxic leader and a toxic individual is, is how he says it when he when he spent time with the Navy SEALs. Or you could have a high performer, sorry, a medium performer of high trust, who is a good leader, who is then able to facilitate those challenges and be able to be more... Um, transitional in the problem solving capacity and so when it comes to culture at scale that's very much down to the line management and I have experienced the same things as you with um, being pressured to fit in at times but also to follow the same status quo with this is how we've always done it now I think if you look at the way leadership now moves with people like Elon Musk it's it's actually endorsed to challenge things in the in the appropriate ways whether you know you you agree with that or not is is something different, but the, some of the best uh, technological advancements, uh, improvements in design, customer beneficiaries has come from the team because we we enable them to have the creativity and ability to be able to bring these ideas forward, and and we try it and we put it into practice, and for example, that's because they see the challenges that are you know being faced on a daily basis, and so. I think from my perspective, that's how we do it internally within my organization. But we also try to do that with the security teams that we operate with. So we're, we, we have a, you know, multiple managed service arms. And within the security operations arm, we spend time with the internal IT team to make sure that we understand exactly the challenges they're facing to make sure that we're supporting and understanding their direction and where they want to get to. Because there is a fine balance with culture and the ways in which, you know, outliers are seen and things like that. But I think that that comes down to the root cause of the are they there to do the job or are they there for a social economics, you know, being a part of a, a friendship group and things like that. And so it's definitely multidimensional. But using the those those three pillars for hiring your your team and asking the right questions at the start. I think it allows you to have a bit more of an understanding around uh, your values as an organization and where you're trying to get to. Thank you. Hi, Ryan. Uh, thanks very much for the for the book recommendation. I agree 100% with the hiring people with different backgrounds. I think that's that's critical to really ensure that, like you said, not everyone has the same approach to the same problem. You want to have uh, d diversity in thought specifically to get, come up with better solutions. We've done a lot of things in the past. They might not have worked, so let's move on to something new. Uh, you talked about hiring the right individual rather than the CV or resume, as we call it in the U.S. How do you feel we can improve the hiring process to both hire better and ensure a win-win between the organization and the new hire? 
And then I have a quick follow up about culture after you answer that one. Uh, I I love that question so much. Um, my my journey into cybersecurity was irregular. I I went to university or college um, to start with, but I didn't I didn't stay the course. I didn't see it through to the end because I wasn't seeing the benefit that I believed was appropriate. And the reason why I got my foot in the door and I worked my way up and and you know moved multiple different companies, but eventually ended up where I am now. It's because effectively someone took a chance on me based on um, my work ethic and what I felt passionate about, which was protecting people at the root cause effectively. And when when I'm hiring people, what what I want to assess is what's what's your core value and why do you actually want to work in cybersecurity? Because to some, it's a sexy industry and there's fast space and things like that. But if you're not, I don't believe, if you're not in it for the right reasons, it's an incredibly difficult industry to survive in, really, because it's so fast paced. And the com- the, the context in which information is transmitted is, is quite vast. And the challenges you'll face on a daily basis can be both very intense, but also, you know, quite mundane with the, the amount of data that, that exists. And so I take that on because someone took a chance on me. And so I don't necessarily look at the ways in which people have got certain certifications or the the right university course or college degree or a number of years of experience because I I hired someone who has been with my team for a year, I think yesterday. And this individual on paper probably wouldn't have gotten interviews in your traditional capacity. Yet what this person did was spent four de- four hours a day, you know, studying and researching because that was his passion. And so if you then unlock that door for that individual and you start paying them a salary and they become on a hyper growth trajectory, they're very unlikely to let you down if if you can enable them to grow in the right way. And, you know, I think when you enable that kind of level of acceptance and understanding and put faith into these people, they grow at probably, I don't know, four times the speed of someone who has come through the traditional pathway because these individuals have had to you know, work for that opportunity and just be given a chance. We've done that a multitude of times. Now, it doesn't work for every organization and it doesn't work for every industry for sure. But... I think hiring the right person, less so what their piece of paper says they can do, because anyone can lie on that piece of paper realistically, both protects the employee because they want to work for their passion and their goal based on it being the right person and right seat for that for that journey. But if it's not right, then there's things like probation periods to protect both sides anyway, if it's not the right fit. And so to me, We've hired lots of people who have come from um, military leaving backgrounds because they approach problems in a different way. They are used to diverse environments where they're used to instant changing in circumstances. And one of the most important qualities that I try to understand is when something's not going right, how do you support your team? Are you the kind of people who's going to support your team when the back's up against the wall or do you throw in the towel? And you, you can easily see that when you interview people based on why they want to be a part of a, a security operations team, for example, to protect organizations or people who work in healthcare and keep those people safe. Because it's that sense of morality where they're able to achieve those things as a as a collective, because it's very hard to do that by yourself. And so that when that team ethic becomes ingrained in your culture, it can be really quite powerful. And I think that's why I choose not to hire based on the specifics of a, a resume in this instance and understand more about the individual and give them an opportunity. Uh, absolutely. Th- thank you for that. I, I think that the, your, your key point there very much aligns with, with my thinking as well, that you you know the resume is the first step or the first uh, part of this. But really, we want to look at uh, beyond just that CV, beyond just that resume, and see what else is there. Um, my follow-on is around 
uh, since the company should support the employees as part of their culture, how should this culture or and and does this culture change or adapt as the company grows from say twenty five to fifty, hundred or more people? And additionally, how does hiring potentially change, or how should the hiring process change as it grows from under a hundred people to five hundred or even a thousand people? Again, that that scaling question is is. A fantastic question because going going from that twenty five to fifty to one hundred to two fifty seat organization, there is naturally going to be a shift in culture because your leaders within the business then uh, have greater responsibility and autonomy, and and that's the way it should be. But choosing the right people to make sure they are consistent with that is a collaborative effort across the board, I believe, and so. The business itself should make sure the mission statement collectively is your underlying message. And if so, so what I don't mean we are trying to hit this revenue goal. I mean, we are trying to protect people from being targeted by people who have nefarious you know, circumstances or purposes behind what they're trying to achieve. And if everybody's aligned to try and do good, for example, then you you start with a baseline where everyone then is on board with that idea and that plan. But going through those motions of hiring huge tranches of individuals and making sure they are adopted into that culture starts with your foundation. If you're building on brick instead of sand, you're, you're more likely to adopt those new hires into that same journey because it can become very infectious. And when it becomes hyper effective as well and people start to exceed their goals and their personal targets because of the support around them, it becomes a a self-sustaining path of travel almost. And it becomes hyper-effective and and it's not based on a single individual to make sure that that continues because everyone around you is aligned to that same goal. When when you get into the into the thousands, it becomes more business unit focused where the challenges are represented in different ways for sure. But I think the underlying mentality and attitude will allow you to protect things in more dynamic capacities, whether you're an internal security team, whether you're, to be, to be quite frank, in any department, this, this can be adopted in the, in the same ways. Yeah, so so the you know a bit of a I don't know if it's an elephant in a room, but uh, you know just kind of thinking through how the whole hiring process works and thinking about this this culture conversation that 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 we're talking about, like one of the issues that I've observed is, is that a a lot of us a, a lot of it is us either lying to ourselves or lying to each other or kind of a mix of both, right? Like you hire somebody, they say, yeah, I'm going to be a great employee, um, never going to do any kind of quiet quitting or, or like, you know, tell you that I'm working and, and do something else instead. Or, you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm great. I don't have any flaws. <laughs> you know, my, 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 my personal problem is I work too hard, all that, you know, and then on the flip side, you know, the employer's like, yeah, we're a great em- employer. Uh, you know, here's our company values. You know, of course, the company values are, I don't know if they're automatically generated by some machine somewhere or, you know, HR just kind of pulls them out of a hat or, you know, I have actually been a, a part of that process for a few startups of coming up with the, with the values for the company. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I, sometimes they're almost humorous, you know, how, how much the values are actually, um, you know, in real life flipped from from what the company says says that they are. Um, so, you know, and, and, and then there's, you know, especially when, when there's an HR involved, you know, there, there's all this, this culture that's, that's kind of manufactured that, you know, like every, you know, we're going to have taco Tuesdays in the cafeteria and, you know, they just try and manufacture all these good feelings and things like that. And then, you know, the things that actually matter, you know, like, like how to respond to, you know, an employee failing a phishing test or something like that. Um, you know, or, or, uh, 
<clears throat> like there's this Twitter account that I'm following now that that's hilarious. And it, it's basically like insider things, you know, but, but, um, um, I don't know how to describe it, but, uh, it, it's basically examples of, of these kinds of things of, of like the company saying one thing and then an employee, uh, you know, it, it, examples of the company doing the exact opposite of, of what they say. You know, I guess it's a, it's the culture equivalent of, uh, we take, uh, uh, your security and privacy of your data very seriously. You know, every company who's ever been breached has had that, that page on, on their web page. So with, with, with that in mind, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand how we work past that, though, because at the same time, am I going to join your company if you tell me, yeah, you know, here's our company values, but, you know, don't get in Phil's way when he throws a temper tantrum, he tends to throw chairs, you know, just, uh, just, just make sure you keep clear of him when that happens. Like, that tends to happen quietly in small groups later, like you, you get filled in on on what the actual company culture is once you're already part of the company. And, you know, may, maybe you're thinking uh, uh, th this could have been a mistake. So, sorry, that's a lot to dump on you right there. But um, <clears throat> I don't know. Is, is there a more straightforward, open way to tackle that? Or does that have to be kind of this behind the scenes, you know, thing that, that you work out one on one with employees? I think. It's, it's really interesting listening to you say some of those things because you start to reflect on instances and experiences that you've had yourself, right? But I think the biggest differential that doesn't happen very much is people enabling their employees and their teams to equate to change. You know, it's still very hierarchical in, in lots of organizations. But when you empower your teams to actually be able to make those changes, they feel empowered, which therefore equates to a positive working environment, the underlying culture improves and all of those sorts of things. And your staff retention goes up because they feel like, oh, I'm having an impact and I'm having, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having an impact by turning up to work and I feel like a part of something. And so I think that is a large part of where people and organizations can stunt growth and create more insular directions. For example, like you just said, where people feel they say one thing and they do another. If the team are saying they're going to do one thing because of X, Y, and Z, and they have the company backing or the, the line management backing, it becomes really, really powerful. And so, like you said, it's, a, it's quite a lot to dissect, but the underlying tonality of that it comes down to trust and it comes down to the reason why people are actually there, I believe. And that may be naive, but I think if people are actually there for the right reason, cybersecurity is, is a very fast paced culture, like, oh, sorry, very fast paced industry, like I said. And I think if you, if you're in a position to be able to affect an impact change for, for the better of everyone around you, it allows for that to be adopted within the culture itself because it's bigger than a single individual. Like you said, it's one person throwing chairs, et cetera. It becomes much more of an, a demonstrable direction within the, the way that the company operates. Things like Taco Tuesdays and things like that. Okay, that's great. That's cherry on top stuff. But it, like you said, at the end of the day, it's more around how people are treated and how people are able to come into work and operate in a safe environment and be able to be effective in what they want to achieve as a collective or individually, well, it's both. And so that that scale of things is where things can become challenging because you have people with different uh, ideas and ulterior motives. But I think at the same time, that's a huge part of it in, in where you can go grow as a company because I, I, I've just said, hiring people from different backgrounds allows you to achieve the same thing in, in 70 different ways. Some are going to be more effective than others. And so by being able to make those uh, statements and those presentations, it allows you to, for you to be effective and enable everybody to work together. Gotcha. Uh, Sean, Tyler, anything? 
Anything else for, for Ryan? I, I think uh, probably the, the best part that I've heard around the, this, this discussion is really employee focused, uh, especially in the cyber field where we tend to focus on blinky bots, but blinky boxes and, and tools and things like that, really investing in the people, giving them the resources. Uh, Ryan, I heard you say something around, you know, f identifying what that interest is that the person has, be it research or something else, and empowering them to be able to go in that direction. And that can really help the organization go in interesting ways that may not necessarily directly relate to the bottom line, but can help improve things overall, whether it's people feel empowered, uh, such as uh, along the lines of what you were talking about, Ryan, is, is making sure that people feel like they are part of something and they are helping to grow it. Um, I think that's what matters. And I hopefully I captured that, Ryan, in, in the way that you said it. Uh, absolutely. And I think uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, um, talks about understanding what makes people tick because not everybody's going to be motivated by the same thing and neither should they because you don't hire everybody in the company for the same motivation because other people are there to be very admin focused to not let process fall down other people are very results driven and are more dynamic in the way that they are going to try and get to that end goal both very different perspectives, motivated by different things. For example, from my perspective, I'm motivated by uh, longevity for my team and employees and everything that encapsulates that. But not everybody in the business is motivated by that same goal because everyone's working on different career trajectories and people see things in different ways. It's, it's the human nature, isn't it? And so, for example, what's, what may be attractive to me may not be attractive to my team, and therefore I can't assess them based on what I believe I would do necessarily. It becomes much more focused around, is, that, is there a common goal and why they want to be in here, which is exactly what you said. And again, that, that comes from a, another Simon Sinek book, to be honest, called Start With Why, and it, it aligns you to be more understanding around the focus in which people want to achieve those things. And if people want to keep people safe effectively within a security operations perspective, or say you're a penetration tester and working in an offensive security and you want to identify the problems before somebody else does and be able to help people fix it, that's, that's ticking that box in your underlying um, focus as, a, as an individual. Then you need to make sure your, you know, the company culture is right and your salary expectations and working environment and it works for you personally and your home life and everything else. And so if you can understand that as a person instead of a here's the job, it's a it's a it's a different way of looking at things. It's more difficult to hire potentially, but I think the retention is much, much higher where people end up staying and your tenure becomes a lot more um, long term. Well said, Ryan. And that is uh, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And The Ideal Team Player, I think, was the other book that you mentioned by Patrick Lencioni. Yeah, that's the one. All right. Good stuff. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. This has been great. I really and appreciate I think, you having me. Thank you. I think somewhat cathartic as well. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back in a few moments with the uh, weekly enterprise news.